So we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Elizabeth Aloni and I'm with Schneps Media. Schneps Media is the largest local media company in the New York metro area. We publish over 70 newspapers, magazines, webinars, websites, podcasts, and events, and do so throughout Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Westchester, Long Island, and Philadelphia. Today, we're gonna to speak with an expert in Medicaid to discuss ways to protect your future and your family. She'll discuss changes in community Medicaid, which is her specialty, long-term care planning, and succession planning. She's from the firm of Krasinski and Klein, and I am thrilled to introduce Tracy Connors. Welcome, Tracy. Hello, everybody. So happy to have you here. Let me tell you a little bit about Tracy. Tracy's been working in the elder law field for approximately 20 years. She managed a Medicaid department for over 12 years, specializing in complicated nursing home and community Medicaid applications. So she certainly has the experience to be able to share with us, and we're thrilled to have you here. Tracy, before we get started, can you tell me a bit about your firm, Krasinski & Klein? Sure. Our offices are here in Brooklyn, and we have one in Manhattan, and we also have one in New Jersey. Our lawyers actually do serve New York and New Jersey. We specialize in a lot of areas, so I'm just going to give you a list that's a bit long. Commercial and civil litigation, construction litigation, disability planning, elder law, of course, estate planning, estate taxes, guardianships, healthcare proxies, living wills, Medicaid planning, my specialty. Medicaid fair hearings, again, my, my arena there. Nurse and home abuse, powers of attorney, probate disputes, real estate law, and wills and trusts. So we are pretty much a one-stop shop all for everybody. We do a little bit of everything. That's great to know. And great to know that, you know, what I love too is that, you know, being able to engage with you, but then if you have other concerns or issues that need attorney's help, it's nice to be able to stay within kind of one one firm and one kind of family. It happens quite a bit. Sometimes we'll start with a trust and estates person mm -hmm. and then, you know, God forbid something happens and the person dies, then we'll move it over to the probate department and there may be a problem with the probate. So the litigation department will get involved. And then our real estate guy, he's always on hand to, you know, help us transfer the houses and the, and the apartments. That's great. That makes me feel comfortable. Like whatever go, whatever goes on, you got, got somebody can do it. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So um, I would love to jump in right away talking about your sure. specialty and for you to share with us about the changes in community Medicaid. Okay. So New York Medicaid has always been health insurance for the poor. And as about 30 years ago, it started being health insurance for the elderly. The elderly started needing home care. And unfortunately, after you leave a hospital, Medicare only pays for a couple of days, a couple of hours a week. After that, it becomes quite costly. It can cost anywhere from four to $5,000 a month just for a basic eight to 12 hour shift wow. per day. Wow. So the basic way Medicaid works is the applicant submits their application. They have to meet certain qualifications. At this moment, you need to be below $15,900 in resources if you're an individual and you get to keep approximately $904 of your income. The rest you would put into a pulled income trust, which we can discuss later. Since 2012, Medicaid turned around and made a plan where they, sort of like the HMO plan, Medicaid basically made it so that we started using what's called a managed long-term care system. The managed long-term care system is sort of like the liaison between you and Medicaid. So, they decided to how many hours you get, what hours you get, who qualifies, who doesn't qualify. So once you hand in your basic application, which is, of course, your personal information, your residential information, your insurance information, your resource information, Medicaid decides if you're approved or not. And then if you need home care hours, you would take that approval and you would go call Maximus and they would do approximately about three hour evaluation to decide a, if you qualify for home care, and once you get that okay, you've got to turn around and basically shop for an MLTC to give you hours per day, days per week. That's the way it works right now. Medicaid's about to flip the script, and as of October 1st, 2020, there will be a look-back period. We got saved a bit 
because of the pandemic. The pandemic has put what we call a public health emergency out. So Medicaid is not allowed to reduce services in any way, shape or form during a public health emergency. Currently under President Trump, the public health emergency has been extended to April 21st. It will be extended again. Everybody is quite sure this. President Biden has already said it's gonna be extended. How far it's gonna be extended, we're not sure. He is talking about extending it to the end of the year. At the moment, at this moment, if you apply for community Medicaid, because you need home care services or you just need health insurance on top of your supplemental health insurance and your Medicare, you should apply by June 30th. Because right now, on the books, as of the, right now, they are saying that July 1st, it is possible that they can put the new plan in place. But like I said, it may not start July 1st because we're still very heavily into COVID. We're still under a public health emergency. As long as this health emergency is going on, then they're actually going to have to keep pushing it back until the public health emergency is over. Once it's over, then Medicaid changes drastically. There will be a 2.5 year look back and every financial document you have will have to start October 1st, 2020. That means if you've made any transfers that you have not been compensated for, or you just gave away money or you put money in trust from October 1st, 2020 till now, until when they actually start this, say they started July 1st, say COVID's over, President Biden's right, we all get our vaccinations, but hands of May, not happening. Um, but in July 1st, we start. That means if you apply for Medicaid, for community Medicaid after July 1st, you have to submit October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, and June's financial statements and prove that you have not made any uncompensated transfers so that you are in indeed eligible for Medicaid. Can you tell us what, um, what, what you mean by uncompensated transfers? Yes, an uncompensated transfer would be a transfer to a trust, a transfer to your child, a transfer to a third party without compensation. Think of it as like a bill. When Con Ed sends you a bill, you send them actual money. So say your bill's $120, but you were compensated because you received electricity for that $120. Medicaid's answer is if you give your grandchild $20,000 and they give you nothing in return for that, that's an uncompensated transfer or a gift. If you turn around and give $200,000 to a trust, and of course you're getting nothing in return because you've literally given it to a trust, that's an uncompensated transfer and you could be penalized. At this moment, we don't have the rules. We don't know how the penalty periods are gonna work. We don't know exactly what they're gonna put in place. None of that, all that's still up for grabs because like everybody else, Medicaid workers are working from home. So they're not having the big powwows and the big meetings that they do to hammer this all out. So everything's a little bit slower. And everything's slower, everything's hazy. So my advice to most people, if you do need Medicaid or you think you're gonna need Medicaid in the near future, start talking to an elder law attorney because you need to start applying now. Even if you don't need home care services now, you can apply for community Medicaid now. So and always I'm, add home care services later. At what age would you recommend someone start talking to an attorney about something because if, if they if there's this how many year look back two and a half year look back period so for home care it's two and a half for nurse at home it's a five year look back so you want so to get ahead of it if possible you want to get ahead of it so nobody wants to think about this we all think we're healthy we're going to live forever we're not going to need medicaid it's not going to happen i've got medicare i've got supplemental health insurance i'm good not really. Unfortunately, we never see the stroke happening. We never see the heart disease happening. We never see cancer on our back door. We never see, you know, Parkinson's coming out of nowhere. There are so many Alzheimer's, dementia. As we live longer, more and more diseases are popping up because we're living well past 70s. You know, my joke to most of my clients is I remember being a little girl, and there were no people over 70 there was like one or two on the whole, in the whole neighborhood. There wasn't a lot of people. Now I have clients who live to 108. Wow. Um, so you don't know what's gonna happen. 
So as you start getting ready to retire and you start getting ready to you know, go on Medicare and you start getting ready to go on Social Security, you should start thinking about how do I do my long-term care planning? How do I start getting ready for just in case I might need Medicaid? How do I protect my assets to make sure the government doesn't get their hands on it? It's so important because I, on the one hand, you don't want to think about the worst case scenario, but if you, if you can think about that and plan for it, there's a weight lifted off your shoulders. Unfortunately, I get a lot of clients that, you know, they're very proud. They, they've always paid their way and that's a great thing. But if you're paying out of pocket for home care month after month after month after month and no end in sight, you're losing all your valuable savings, what you worked for your entire life to, to save. And you don't know how long you're going to live. So you need money to keep going for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And a nursing home here in New York City, the cheapest is about 15000 a month. Wow. The most expensive is about $25,000 a month. So really, you need a vent, it's even more. So all of your savings can be eaten up and a lot of that can be prevented potentially, at least find out, you know, about at least find out, at least start planning. Exactly. Protect exactly. yourself. You also, if you have children, you are relatives or charities that you like, you want to be able to leave them a little something. You don't want to be down to your last dollar. Absolutely. That adds stress to a time when you really just, the last thing you need is additional stress like that. Exactly. So now Medicaid can be used, you know, you keep talking about long-term planning. Um, can you share with us about how Medicaid kind of plays into the long-term planning and then other sure. options for long-term planning? So there are two ways to think about long-term care planning. So long-term care can either be long-term care insurance, which a lot of our elderly have purchased. Um, the more, more, the higher premium you pay, the better you get. Most of them are average about $250 a day, which gets you some home care and which pays for, you know, about half a day of nurse at home per day. But at the end of the day, it's quite costly. It's an insurance product that helps provide for the cost of long-term care, which generally covers home care, assisted living, adult daycare, respite care, hospice care, nurse at homes. But again, the premiums can be very expensive and you keep paying the premiums until you actually need to use the pro policy. So if you buy it at 60, but you end up not needing home care until you're 82, you've just paid 22 years worth of premiums. Wow. And it could be quite costly. Like I said, you know, if you bought it at 60, you probably thought $250 a day was fantastic. But you get to 82 and you find out, wow, a nursing home costs over $500 a day. And that's at a medium nursing home. That's at a moderate nursing home. That's not a fancy nurse at home or a great nurse at home. And you're sitting there going, how am I going to make up the rest of that money? Right. Well, I'm working out my penalty period. Right. It's not $250 a day living the way you're living now. It's Even $250 the, a day. The a cheapest nurse at home is $265 a day. And that's, I mean, a nurse at home, I wouldn't send anybody to, but the cheapest one, private pay is $265 a day. And that was about three years ago. And as you can see, that won't even pay for your, that long-term care policy won't even pay for that, that nurse at home. Never mind a nurse at home like Hebrew home, which is something like $600 a day. Wow. So that I could see how that could really eat up your savings. So yes. talk, to, talk to us about how Medicaid can, can play. Okay. So let me explain a little bit about Medicaid. Medicaid is a means tested program. It's jointly funded by the state and the federal governments. It's managed by the individual states. And each state has the right to determine eligibility, who's eligible and how the program is actually implemented. The states are not required to participate in the program, but as you know, all 50 states do participate in the program. Um, we're lucky here in New York was we actually have a decent home care system. The other 49 states do not. The, um, a handful of the other states do have some kind of home care program but it's not to the extent, New York is one of the only places where you can actually get 24 hour living care or 24 hour split shift care. Wow. None of the other states. We have the best Medicaid program. When you're determining eligibility for Medicaid in New York, there are two tests that you must meet. The asset test 
And like I said, that asset has, you know, all of your resources, all your financial resources, that's your bank accounts, your brokerage accounts, your CDs, bonds, whatever you have, have to come out to less than 15,900 for an individual and 23,400 for a couple going on Medicaid. The second test is called an income test. For an individual, that's $904 a day. For a couple, it's $1,320. Your surplus gets put into what's called a pooled income trust, and that would be a whole seminar in and of itself. But the federal government did make a program called the pooled income trust run for non for profits so that you can put your surplus income to those pooled income trusts and they will help you pay your monthly bills. They will pay bills on behalf of the beneficiary so that you don't lose all your money. You don't have to give, say you make, I don't know, $2,000 a month. If you're only allowed to keep 900, where does the other 1100 go? It would normally go to Medicaid, but instead you can give it to the pulled income trust and the pulled income trust will take some fees out. They're very nominal fees. And then they will pay bills on your behalf, like your rent, your con ed, your phone, your cable, your credit card bills. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's a lot. Um, if the individual is married and the spouse doesn't receive care, so say I have a husband, he's going on Medicaid, but I'm not, Medicaid can try to get reimbursed from the community spouse, which would be me, because I'm not on Medicaid. I'm living in the community with him, but I'm not on Medicaid. If I have more than approximately, the, the gambit runs from $74,820 to about um, $130,000. You have to be somewhere in between that. If you're over that, Medicaid can come knocking saying, hi, so we're giving your hubby Medicaid and we've been giving him home care all this time and you have a lot more than $130,000. So you need to kick in. But you're sitting there going, but I need that money. I, I need to survive and I need to make sure he survives. And what do I do? That's when we get over to succession planning. But... Let me explain a little more about assets. There are assets that are considered exempt from the asset test. Things that you can hold on to that have absolutely that will not be counted. This is your 401k, your IRAs, as long as they're in payout status, meaning that you are collecting your RMD, which is a required minimum distribution. Once you hit 70 and a half, if you have a 401k, you have an IRA, you have some kind of retirement vehicle, you're supposed to turn it on and actually receive your required minimum distribution every year as part of your income. The other things that are exempt, Holocaust reparations. Believe it or not, we do still have people who are getting Holocaust reparations. Um, your primary residence up to about $900,000 is exempt. So if you have a house and it's worth $800,000 in your primary residence, that house is exempt from Medicaid while you're on community Medicaid, not for nursing home. I have a question. If you're, if you're still paying a mortgage on your house, are the payments for the mortgage not? Counted? Okay. So say your house is now worth $1.2 million, but you have a $400,000 mortgage. Yes. Your house is only seen as worth $800,000 because it has this $400,000 bill on it. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, and if you're married and the house is in both names, it's half and half. So if you have a $2 million house, it's $1 million on each side minus your mortgage, and we figure it out. Um, therefore, those exempt assets can stay in your name, won't be a problem for Medicaid. There is a caveat, though. Medicaid may put a lien on, on a primary residence or put a claim against your estate because you got to remember, you've basically asked the federal government to pay your medical bills. And should you pass and you leave an estate, they are, they're a creditor. They have a right to go after it. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, so if you keep your- With yeah. the succession planning, which we're gonna to get to in a minute, are those the things that you can do to kind of protect yourself from some yes. of these? Succession okay. planning is how we're gonna protect our assets. Okay, just want everyone to know, we're gonna to get to- We're gonna to get there. Not all time to bloom. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. Um, so we generally, when we, when we meet people, we generally talk to them about trust, wills, power attorneys, healthcare proxies, and protecting their assets and putting their, their major asset, which is generally your house, 
that one big house that you saved forever and you've been paying forever, you know, that 30 year mortgage, that's your major asset. So nurse and home Medicaid, there's a five year look back for nurse and home Medicaid, if, which what it means. And if an individual needs nurse and home care, they have to provide all their financial statements for the past five years. So for an example, if I apply for Medicaid, I land in a nurse and home right now, I run through my Medicare days and I need Medicaid to start paying as of June 1st. Medicaid's gonna turn around and say, great. So it's June 2021, give us five years back of financial statements and explain to us every deposit and every withdrawal for $2,000 or more. It's 60 months of statements for everything. So if you had a brokerage statement, you had a, a um, check-in and a savings, you had a CD, all these things you have to hand over to Medicaid and show them what happened during those five years and explain any transfers that may have happened during those five years and any big deposits that may have happened during those five years. So they're making sure that you're not making, you're not giving your money away. Away in order to become eligible for Medicaid. Yes. Basically, they're seeing whether the individual made any transfer assets without fair compensation or consideration. So basically, you're gifting it away. If the individual has made transfers without fair compensation or consideration, there, there is a penalty period during which time the individual will have to privately pay for their nurse and home care until Medicaid would start to pay, until you actually qualified for Medicaid. The penalty period is calculated using a formula based on the Medicaid regional rate. So basically, we find out what county you actually reside in, and that county belongs to a region. There are seven regions in New York, and that region each has a rate. So just for example, New York City's regional rate at this moment, which of course includes the five boroughs, is $13,037. But remember what I said earlier, the lowest nurse at home, a nurse at home I wouldn't put you in, is about $15,000 to start. But the regional rate's only 13,000. So if you're transferring $200,000, you're getting, you're only getting credit for $13,000 a month, but you're spending 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, $20,000 a month in that nursing home. So it never comes out to 50 50s. We have ways to work this out. We do private annuities, we do promissory notes, but it ends up, you always end up having to, it's about 60 40. You get to get, keep about 40% of your assets and pay about 60% of your assets to the nursing home if you don't plan ahead. You need to plan ahead with the thought that I might need nursing home in five years. I need to clear that five year hurdle. Tracy, is there any amount that you are allowed to gift? You know how, like, forget about Medicaid, but in other- So here's the fun thing. Um, the IRS tells you that you can get away without paying taxes and give away $15,000 a year. Medicaid says you can't. So Medicaid basically says that if you make any transfers for $2,000 or more, that's a transfer and it's penalized. Okay, it's good to know. You need to know these things. Yeah, so what the IRS allows, Medicaid does not. And this is why it's really great to come into an elder law attorney, pay the consultation fee, sit down for two hours, explain everything you have, Put your cards on the table and let them at least come up with a game plan. You don't have to go forward. You don't, but you need to know what your options are and, you know, how much you're worth and, how, you know, what planning tools are there out there to help you. And the sooner the better you can do that. I mean, it's never too late, but it's also it's never too late, but it's never, never, too early. Early. never too early either. Well, you know, they're one of those things when we have people that are hesitant to use a trust because, you know, we generally, you need to use an irrevocable trust for it to actually start the five-year clock. But if you're hesitant and you want to start slow, we also can do revocable trust where the individual is still the grantor and they're still the trustee. So they're still in control. And then we can gradually turn it into an irrevocable trust and start that five-year clock. And you'll share a little bit more with that about, about that. Yes. 
There are ways to protect your assets while still becoming eligible for Medicaid. We can prepare an irrevocable trust, as I just mentioned, for you to transfer your primary residence and your other assets, such as brokerage accounts, um, CDs that you may have, bonds that you may have, stocks. While you can keep your residence in your name and still be eligible for Medicaid because your home is exempt. If you're on community Medicaid, it is exempt. Your home set is exempt up to exactly $906,000. It's a very weird number, but it's 906. Yeah, that is odd. It, they make it a weird number every year. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, if They do it by some little percentages. If you transfer your residence to insure trust, and an irrevocable trust, it will protect your residents from any potential Medicaid liens down the road. Further, putting your assets into a trust will help you avoid probate, which will prevent Medicaid from making a claim against your estate. And that's important. You know, a will is fine and dandy, but all a will does is say, hey, gather up my assets and here's how you divvy it up. Oh, but don't forget my creditors. The creditors come first. And that's the problem. But a trust, if you put your assets in a trust, creditors can't get to it because it's not probate by a will. The trust is a solo, a solo entity by itself. And that would lead us into succession planning. Yes, I do. I want to hear about that and the three ways that someone can pass assets upon death. This is really important. This is kind of where all, all the worst case scenarios can potentially be avoided. Exactly. So succession plan is ensuring your assets pass in the manner that you intended upon your death. You've sat down, you said, I want to make sure that my house and my money all goes to my kids. Well, how do you make sure that happens? There are three ways so you can make sure that happens. Three ways you transfer your assets, or pass them down upon your death is A, operation of law, two, the trust, and three, the last will and testament. The operation of law. These are accounts with named beneficiaries, such as your life insurance. When you take out a life insurance policy, one of the first things they ask you is, who do you want it to go to at the end of the day? So if you say, I'm taking out my life insurance policy for a million dollars and I want it to go to child A, child B, and child C, they'll actually give you a beneficiary form and you'll fill it out. And you may even fill out contingent beneficiaries in case, God forbid, something happens to those children. There are also joint accounts. You know, if you have a joint right, a joint bank account with your wife, you get to keep the joint account, even if your wife passes. There are accounts with the right of survivorship. There's accounts that are in trust for, you know, a checking accounts generally not are in trust for, but in savings accounts, a lot of them, it's you usually see the letters ITF. The ITF is in trust for. So if it's in trust for, say I left it for you, Elizabeth. It's my account. I die. It's $100,000, but it says in trust for Elizabeth. Elizabeth goes to the bank. She brings a death certificate and proves, or the ID proves that she's Elizabeth. She gets the account. No will needed, no trust needed, passes outside the estate. Okay. If you have any of these kinds of accounts, then upon your death, these assets will automatically pass to the named beneficiaries, just like I showed you in the example. Trust. If there are assets held in a trust, the terms of the trust will dictate where the trust assets go upon your death. Now, your trust and your will can marry each other. So you can actually say, I have my house in my trust, I have my brokerage account in my trust, I have my life insurance in my trust, I have all these things in my trust, and this is how I want to divvy it up. And you can actually name, the house goes to Jenny, the brokerage account goes to Billy, or he only gets half and half goes to Sally you can decide where all the assets go at the end so, of the day. So you need to have both. So you have a trust that's kind of like the holding place for all of your assets. And then you have the will, which determines where things no. go. Okay. No. So the trust actually determines where things go. Okay. You can have a standalone will, which is different. And then there are things like a pour over will. So there's a, generally when we sell a trust, we, send, we sell a pour over will. Because there are things you might have forgotten to put inside the trust. Once you give an asset to the trust, the trust has, just like you have a social security number, the trust has an EIN number. So the trust actually is an entity. It just needs a human to act on its behalf, name as a trustee. 
but the trust has its own EIN number. It has an address. It's an actual entity. It can file taxes. It can hold assets. So just like you can have a bank account, the trust can have a bank account. Just like you can have a brokerage account or own a house, so can the trust. Can you and, access your assets that are in a trust at any time you want? as easily as you could if it was in a bank no. account? No, so or that's the question. Whether you do revocable, where yes, you can access them at all you want, or an irrevocable. And the irrevocable trust we generally do for Medicaid planning does not allow you to ever touch the principal. And most of them don't actually even pay you out the income. So it leaves it so that your trustees can pay bills on your behalf. So the trustees generally have a set number of beneficiaries that they kick money out to, and those beneficiaries will pay things for you. So the house, you know, the boiler breaks, the trust can actually just pay for the boiler because the trust owns the house. There are ways to get money out of the trust legally for your benefit, but not directly to you if it's irrevocable. Because the whole point of an irrevocable trust is that I'm giving it to this entity. It's no longer mine. Mm. And who can the trustee be? Can it be your spouse? Can it be? Well, that's a good question. So the question is, if your spouse is around the same age as you, you may not want to make that choice. Um, if it makes you comfortable, you can start with a spouse if they're much healthier than you are. Um, most people tend to pick children or close, close family friends or close family relatives that they know has, they're trustworthy. They're not going to run away with the assets. And they have a good head on their shoulder. And they're going to actually follow what you want. Because at the end of the day, you kind of want them to follow. Even though you're handing all these assets over to a trust, you want your trustees to be, I mean, it's right there in the word. You want them to be trustworthy. You're trusting them to take care of these assets held by this entity for you. And to take care of them in the way that you would see fit. The last um way we can do this is a last will and testament where it, we're not doing a trust we're basically saying my will provides where all the rest of your assets held in your individual name will pass upon your death that means your will does not apply to any assets held in a joint account or an account with a name beneficiary like a life insurance further your will does not apply to any assets held in the trust like i said if the trust owns it the trust owns it the will does not dictate however what the will can do is if you don't have a trust and you have a brokerage account and you have a house and you have some CDs and you have some bonds, the will will have an executor that you've named, you've picked this person, and that person will go gather up your assets after they get permission from the court and they can actually gather it all up into an estate account and then they will divvy it up per the terms of the will. But again, that leaves you open to creditors because if it's all in your name when you die and you owe a bunch of creditors such as Medicaid, then Medicaid can come knocking because uh, if anybody's ever probated a will, you have to sit there and wait seven months after you get your letters naming you the executor saying that you can go gather the assets for creditors to come out of the woodwork. And Medicaid, you got to remember, if you're in a nursing home or you're on community Medicaid and you're getting home care, they know when you died. They know before everybody else does. The home care agency will tell them, the nurse at home will tell them. So the will requires, even though it can say where your assets go, it requires this probate. You what have to get the you have to get surrogate court in your county to actually basically give you what's called letters so that your executor can go forward and actually do their job. What about a trust? If you pass and there's a trust, is there any? Nope, the trustees can act right upon your death. So that they can, can act right away. And they have their marching orders inside the trust and tells them, well, don't, before you give anything else out, let's give $10,000 to the um, AMC, the Ameri yeah, Animal Medical Center, just came out to mind. <laughs> you know, and, then it says, okay, and the rest of it, I want to divide it this way, you know, five ways between my five kids or, you know, one fourth to this child and only this to this child and this to this child. But the trust has it all written out. There's literally instructions on who gets what, when, and how in the trust. When you put things into a trust, 
is that part of a look back period? Yes. Okay. So if I say you come to me today, I, I just, I'm sorry, I just saw the question <laughs> from somebody else. Say you turn, you come to us today. So you put everything into a trust today. The first thing I'm going to tell you, and the first thing Mr. Klein's going to tell you, is that if you put everything to a trust, we managed to get everything in the trust by April 30th. Your look back period, the clock starts for you, May 1st, 2021. For you to walk into a nursing home on Medicaid's dollar, free and clear, you'd have to wait until literally May 1st, 2026. But in the meantime, you can apply for community Medicaid. So this again speaks to why it's important to plan ahead. Yes. <laughs> because if you can plan ahead and put your assets in a trust, now do you help people? Plan while you're healthy. And it sounds ridiculous. And take my word for it. I have a million clients that come to me way too late. They're in the nursing home. They did absolutely nothing. We're scrambling to do all this now. And then, like I said, we end up having to do kind of the planning where we have to use a promissory note and you only get to keep about 40% of your assets. We can only save about 40% if you wait till you're on the doorstep of the, door, of the nursing home. Don't let that happen to you. <laughs> plan. If you can plan, plan. If now that you know exactly. knowledge is power. It's like now that you have this information, Get moving on it because this can save a tremendous amount of money and, and angst for you and your family. Exactly. Because with a trust, it's life, like I said, it's much easier. It's so much easier because you have your marching orders. It's all in the trust already. The trust already owns these things and you can divvy them up pretty easily. With the will, you have to go to probate court. You have to gather up the assets after you get permission from the court. And then you have to sit back and wait for the creditors to see if they come out of the woodwork. Wow. And, and if you get on Medicaid, they will come out of the woodwork. Do, do you and your team help people determine, so for example, if you wanna put money, let's say you wanna put money in a home and all that into a trust, and you're doing it ahead of time, you're planning like we're talking about, how do you know, you know do you help people decide like what percentage do they keep outside of that so they can just live without having to go through a trustee that's generally a personal decision, and some of it is based on how close are you to need a Medicaid? What is your health situation? That's one of the first questions I usually ask. Tell me about your health. Tell me about your wife's health. What can you do for yourself? What can't you do for yourself? Where are we at medically first? And then tell me where you're at financially. Because that, you know, I need to know if you're telling me, you know, I had a client the other day walk in and tell me that he's had five bypasses. And I'm like, you need to trust yesterday. You need to trust now. We didn't, you know, you can have a heart attack at any given time. You've had five bypasses. Your, your health is not solid. We, we need to start now. You know, and it's a little scary. But, you know, when they tell me the truth and they tell me what's going on health wise, I have to take all that into consideration. No, it's very critical. It's the best thing you can do for somebody. If you're sitting there telling me you're a jogger and you're perfectly healthy and your doctor is giving you a clean bill of health, you have more time. You can keep more money out. But if you're telling me you have five bypasses, I'm thinking you're going to need Medicaid sooner than later. And we should put most of your assets into the trust. Great. So that's how you really work with, you can work with people, you and your team yes. can work with people specifically. Obviously, these are very specific questions based on your situation, your health, your financial situation, but it is important that it, that is something to think about. Yes. Fantastic. Um, do you want to, so you've really gone through a lot with that. Cause I was gonna say like, you, you made it so easy to understand too, which I really appreciate. And we do have some questions here from our attendees sure. that I'd love to, to get to. Um, let's see. So let me get to Felicia. She wants to know, can creditors get money from your IRA money? No, that's one of those things that, um, the government has, um, actually protected. So creditors generally can't go after your IRAs. They can't go after retirement vehicles. Okay. That's good to know. So that's another area is retirement. Well, yeah, that, that, that's, you know, that, that's pretty much the limit of my understanding for that. <laughs> and again, you would need someone like 
the, one of the partners at my law firm, Joe Klein, who is also a tax accountant, as well as an attorney, and he's been doing this for about 20 years as well, to actually sit down and go through those kind of more in-depth questions. Right, right. Okay, good. Um, John, John said, to be clear, revocable and irrevocable trusts can avoid probate in New York. Is that correct? Yes, yes because revocable trusts upon your death become irrevocable. Got it. Almost every single revocable trust I've ever seen, and definitely the ones we draft, become irrevocable at the moment of your death. Got it. Okay. Um, Michelle has a question. And Michelle, maybe you can... Um, help us understand your question, because you said, how does this affect seniors over 60 who already have Medicaid, but not long-term health care? I want to get back to that question because she asked it at a certain time. Michelle, if you can just um, put in the chat, be a little more specific about what in particular, we will certainly get to that question. Um, Paulette wants to know, how difficult is it to sell a house that is owned by a trust? It's not difficult at all. It's the same as selling it if you owned it. Because, like I said, the trust is an entity. It has an EIN number. You would sell the trust and then you would sell the house in the name of the trust. And then the proceeds would be written out in a check to back to the trust. And you would put it in an account owned by the trust. So then do you have to file taxes for a trust? So it depends on how the trust is written. Um, most trusts are written so that the Medicaid applicant is the grantor. And it, all the all income is actually recorded on their personal taxes. However, you can file, like I said, you have an EIN number. So the trust can go file trust, uh, trustee taxes. The trustee can go file taxes in the name of the trust, but understand that trusts pay a higher tax than individuals. Wow. So most people roll the taxes right onto the grantor's taxes. Okay, that makes and sense. So if it's mom's trust, at the end of the year, she'll get a K-1 from the trust and she will give it to her tax accountant and he'll put it on her taxes for any income the trust has made. Okay, great. Lucy wants to know, are funeral expenses exempt and how much can be set aside? Good question. So funeral expenses and legal expenses, which I love, is two of the things that Medicaid allows. So Medicaid allows you to buy what's called an irrevocable Medicaid pre-planned trust. Remember what I said, irrevocable. So again, that tells you that if you go buy, if you go to, you know, Bob Smith's funeral home and you say, I want an irrevocable Medicaid trust. I want an irrevocable funeral. And you make all your choices, you make all these pickings, you spend $15,000 on a funeral for yourself because you're doing it ahead of time. And it's one of the things that Medicaid actually lets you buy with your money. It's not, it's actually, you're getting compensated. It's consideration. You bought a funeral, you own something, you got something for that $15,000. And things happen. You can always change the details of the funeral agreement, but you can never take the money back out. So it's still $15,000 today, tomorrow, five years from now, but they may not no longer carry the casket you chose. <laughs> a little morbid, but you may have to pick another one or you wanna change some of the arrangements or you want to change the flowers or where the flowers came from because that florist went out of business thanks to COVID. That kind of thing can be done. So you actually not only have to, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to put this $10,000 towards funeral expenses. You have to actually book a funeral, so to speak. Yeah, it's a little morbid, but yes, you have to actually go to a funeral home and pick out your funeral. You have to actually think about it and pick out your funeral. Here's the upside to this. And I can tell you from 20 years of experience, it makes life easier on the ones you leave behind. If it's all said and done and mom picked it out herself, all they have to do is go to the funeral home and say, mom's passed, let's move on it. They don't have to sit there and try to figure out what to do, what to pick. And not, not trying to be mean to funeral homes, but it's a great business. I mean, you've got a grieving family sitting in front of you who want to do the absolute best for mom. They're going to spend gaggles of money that they might not have spent before had mom prepaid it because mom knows exactly what mom wants. And it's a stressful time to have to make those decisions. I mean, honestly, it sounds like a nice gift to give your family 
that you've done that and they just, they, they can just, you know. Grieve. And Medicaid even lets you buy funerals, prepaid funerals for your immediate family too. Oh, wow. Okay. See, these are good, the good things that, you know, in meeting and talking about this kind of stuff, you learn. Mm-hmm. Um, so Carolyn has a question. I'm not sure if you have an answer to this, um, but let's, let's go for it. Okay. Um, my Medicaid health first sent me a notice a few months ago that most OTC meds will no longer be covered. What can be done? I have a medical need for an expensive OTC eye ointment. Our doctor submitted approval request um, for the ointment and they denied it because it's no longer covered by Medicaid. Um, you know, what can people do about this kind of a thing? There's not a lot you can do. Does she, um, you got to see if you have uh, Medicare and um, ARP. If they don't cover the over the counter medications, you might need to switch plans. Um, then again, call Health First and see if there's a way to appeal this. Ask them if there's a way to appeal it. It's really hard when an insurance company, and that's what Medicaid is at the end of the day, it's an insurance company. At the end of the day, if they say they will not cover it, there's not a lot you can do, but sometimes you can appeal it. Sometimes you can get a fair hearing on these kind of things. Okay, thank you for that. Pablo wants to know what records you need to set up an estate plan. So generally for an estate plan, if you want to do your estate planning, we usually ask for your latest bank statements, your latest financial statements. If you own a house, we'll ask you to bring the deed. If you've ever done a power attorney, a healthcare proxy, we'll ask you to bring that. If you've ever done a will, we'll ask you to bring that. Um, we'll ask you to bring the latest bank statements for all your checking, your savings, your bonds, your CDs, your stocks, your brokerage, your IRAs, your 401ks, your 403bs, whatever you have financially. Whatever asset you own that's worth something, bring the latest and we'll figure out what to do with it. Terrific. Um, Dee and um, Carol both wanted, had a similar question. One wanted to know, are annuities protected in an irrevocable trust? Um, and also, you know, are Roth, Roth IRAs? So Roth IRAs, again, um, Roth IRAs, you have to turn it on. You have to actually be physically taking your required minimum distribution. The sad thing is if you're over 65, even though the IRS lets you wait to your 70 and a half, Medicaid doesn't. So unless it's some, unless you're still working or it's some kind of work IRA or 401k that won't allow you to take it out, you, you do have to take out your RMD. But the Roth IRAs are, are protected as well. But again, if you're applying for Medicaid and you're claiming that you're disabled and you need home care, then you're going to have to take out your required minimum distribution. And if you're in the five boroughs, you're in great shape. You're under the IRS rules, so it's much higher. If you're in the outer counties, any of the other 57 counties, it's Medicaid's chart, not the IRS chart. And it's about half the amount of years that you're allowed under the IRS chart. Oh, wow. Interesting. But the annuities are a different question. The annuities, um, you can put annuities, as long as they're not actual retirement vehicles, you can put them into the trust. Okay, great, thank you. Celeste wants to know, can Medicaid go after all your assets or just the amount beyond the 130,000? So it's a funny thing. It's the Medicaid never technically goes after anybody. It's, it's, a, it's a, a weird kind of conception. So what they do is if, you're, if your spouse is on community Medicaid or nurse and home Medicaid and you have more than the 130, what they're going to do is the minute they get approved, that MLTC or that nurse and home is going to send Medicaid a bill uh, up to that point. Nurse and home is a little easier to talk about this for. So I walk into a nurse and home in January, my Medicare days end, end of February, March 1st, I need Medicaid but I don't get approved to June 1st. So Medicaid approves me in June, but now the nursing home's gonna turn around and what are they gonna do? They're gonna give Medicaid a bill for March, April, May, and June. And then Medicaid's gonna turn around and say, hi, you have up more than the 130, how are you doing? This is what we paid for those four months and you should pay us back now, thanks. And then at that point, if you've not already tried to do your own estate planning as a spouse, and that's a totally different issue, um, then you should get an elder law attorney to try to negotiate that. But 
the minute if, for nursing homes a little different than everything else and it will be different once this 2.5 look back starts i'm just warning everybody now it'll be like many nursing home applications once it starts and if you have a spouse here your spouse is an exempt transfer which is a fabulous thing so if I'm married and my husband goes on Medicaid. He can transfer all of his assets to me, keep his $15,000. He goes off to the nursing home, gets on nursing home Medicaid, and then Medicaid is going to come knocking on my door if I have more than 130. But my argument to Medicaid, with the help of an elder law attorney, of course, is hey, well, I'm stuck with the whole five year look back because he got the free ride. So I need to do my own estate planning. So I threw it all into my trust. Thanks. Now, does that get you free and clear? No. It means that that same example, you may owe Medicaid for March, April, May, and June, which they did pay. And then you turned around and threw everything in your trust. And July 1st, everything by July 1st, everything was in your trust. But you're still out there for those four months. So for those four months, you do owe Medicaid. And my answer to you, again, would be get an elder law attorney, let them negotiate Medicaid and prove that you have owned, if done your own estate planning for your own five-year look back. Wow, that's great advice. Goes to show you how much <laughs> you can learn when you go to an expert about these things, because it's a lot of intricacies. That's and a lot. And you can, everybody's situation is different. Yeah, and over 20 years, plus the years of, of your partners, I mean, you've seen probably almost all. And, Pretty and much. These things. All right, so Michelle got back to us about her question. She said her husband has communicated community Medicaid. Okay. He's not sick, but he has a chronic health condition. Okay. He doesn't, they don't have indication that they need long-term care, but in the event that they were to get ill and need long-term care, does having community Medicaid make it easier to transition to long-term care? Yes. And as a caveat, she has private insurance. So does that, they're married, but does that affect her at all? Awesome. No, it doesn't affect her at all. And once he does need long-term care, yes, it, it's a much easier, it's basically just an upgrade because he's already on community Medicaid and she should do, she should make sure that she re-enrolls him every year. She recertifies him every year. And once he needs the long-term care, she'll just simply at that time under the new rules and under the old rules, call Maximus and ask for an evaluation for home care services. But with the new rules, one of the caveats is that if you don't have dementia, then you need actual physical help with two or more ADLs. And ADLs are activities of daily living, which means that your husband would need to need help with either using the toilet, grooming himself, bathing himself, dressing himself, these kind of things, eating. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So say you set up an, uh, Sandra wants to know, say you set up an irrevocable trust and hold $15,000 out in a bank account for yourself. And over time you spend it down. Mm -hmm. Can you trustees ever top up your bank account from the trust if needed? Not directly from the trust. They would kick it out to whoever they're allowed to kick it out under the terms of your trust. And that person can always top you off. And that would be seen for but both basically for the new rules and for nursing home Medicaid, it would be seen as a return of asset. So if I gave away $100,000 to a trust and you return 10 of it to me, then truthfully, I only made a gift of 90,000 at this point. It just reduces what I've given to the trust. But again, you'd have to get it out properly. So it'd have to go from the trust to that select group of people that it's allowed to kick out to and then from them to you. And generally we try to tell you, we should never, never do that. We should just have those group of people that are allowed to get money from the trust pay bills on your behalf. Okay, great. But so it has happened where people have like almost no money. So it, 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 it's something that you have to deal with on a time, person by person, case by case basis. And that's very important. So D has D has a question, which I think is a great one to end on, which is it's never too early to plan, but what is the recommended age to establish a trust for a healthy person? I would think about it in your fifties. My argument has always been for the last 20 years that in your fifties, 
you're not retiring yet. You got you've you've accomplished most of what you're going to accomplish. You've you've gathered most of your assets, and you can, like I said, you can start with a revocable trust, where you gather up all your eggs in that one basket, and a simple amendment makes it irrevocable when you need to. Terrific! Wow, this has been so incredibly helpful. Thank you so much, Tracy. I see, I see one more question. Let me just ask you, Maurice, do you recommend using a community pooled trust to help someone qualify for the Medicare savings program? It doesn't help them qualify for the Medicare savings program. The Medicare savings program is based on your gross income. So um, the pooled income trust is only for Medicaid applicants. Okay, terrific. Amazing. So, I mean, for the savings program, it's based on your gross income, no matter what, just like food stamps and everything. This comes up all the time. Well, I give all my money to the pool trust. So I'm, aren't I eligible? I only have the $904. No, it's, the food stamps program and all these other programs are all based on your gross income. Giving it to a pool trust is not a transfer in a sense that you get to use the money. The pool trust will pay bills on your behalf. It's still your income. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Tracy, we're going to, this has been recorded. I wanted everyone okay. to know, and it will be available for everyone to be able to watch it again and to okay. share it with your community. So please, our attendees, you'll, you'll get the link. You'll be able to share it. You'll also get an email tomorrow with all of Tracy's contact information. So you can reach out to her directly and speak to her or one of her colleagues if it's appropriate and be able to do so and, and get yourself ready. Because I think, you know, the one thing we certainly learned today was that it's so important to plan for your future and protect your loved ones. And Tracy, thank you so much for You're showing very welcome. Many ways to be able to do that. Everyone is saying thank you in the chat. Everyone is really appreciative. So thank you all for joining us today. So happy you could spend some of your afternoon with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Have okay, a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.